Jennifer's the author of The Invisible Circus, which was released as a feature film by Fine Line in 2001, Emerald City, and other stories, which I knew many of the faculty here use in their classwork, Look at Me, which was nominated for the National Book Award in 2001, and the best-selling The Keep. Uh, her new book, A Visit from the Goon Squad, Squad, I'm sorry, A Visit from the Goon Squad, it's wonderful, you should all read it, and it's for sale today. Um, it uh, was a national bestseller, it won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction, and the LA Times Book Prize, an enormous success. We are extraordinarily privileged to have with us today. It's nice to come back to this block. I lived for um, five years on 28th between 6th and 7th, and in the last chapter of this book, there's a guy who's very... Um, sort of, uh, he's uh, unhappy and, and has filled with a sense of foreboding because he lives in an apartment and a high rise is going up right next door to it and it's slowly starting to encroach on his windows. And that actually is what happened in the building that I lived in after we moved out. A high rise went up in the middle of 28th between 6th and 7th and it covers all three of the windows that we had. And I, I, I guess imaginatively I thought like, oh my God, what if we still lived there? And I had had to endure that. I, I lived for the light coming through those three windows and I would like follow it during the day. So anyway, the, the book feels connected with this location. Um, I thought I would just talk for a couple of minutes about the, the structure of the book and how I arrived at it. And then I'm going to read just the beginning of the first chapter and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I usually write fiction uh, with very little more at the beginning than just a sense of time and place. That's really where I start. And in some ways, that's kind of all I want to have when I start. In the case of this book, which I did not begin thinking I was writing a book, I actually was avoiding a different book, um, which I'm sorry to say I am still effectively avoiding. We'll see what else it motivates me to do as a form of procrastination. Um, but I was having dinner with my mom at a hotel she was visiting from California and I was using the bathroom and washing my hands I looked down and saw a wallet lying exposed in a woman's handbag just literally sitting there and I thought oh my god how could you do that because I myself have been robbed so many times and ways uh, not just in New York but all over the world actually um, and one particular theft has always stuck with me, which did happen in New York um, about 17 years ago. My wallet was stolen and I was extremely upset because I was actually going to fly later in the day and I just, I didn't have any money, I didn't have any credit cards and I was sort of flipping out and in, in the middle of my trying to figure out what to do, my phone rang and it was Citibank. It was this lovely woman from the fraud um, recovery program and she said, look, we're here to help you. We're going to sort this out. You know, let's go through step by step what you've lost, and we'll we'll set it all up for you. And I was so relieved that I actually wept on the phone with her. And um, we went through, you know, the couple of credit cards I had, and then it came time to uh, get a new cash card and choose my new PIN number. And in the course of doing that, I also mentioned my old PIN number. And then the conversation wound down swiftly because I was talking to the thief. And she was really good at impersonating a Citibank employee to the point where I actually wondered if maybe she had worked in a bank at some point. Um, anyway, so she promptly ran to the nearest cash machine and overdrew my checking account. And if you think I was upset before that happened, <laughs> you can't imagine the state I was in after I figured out what had occurred. <laughs> Anyway, you know, no bodily harm. It was all okay. I got the money back. And, um, but I was really haunted by the question of who this woman had been and what the conversation was like from her end. For some reason, this seemed very important for a while. Like, did she feel sympathy or not? That was the question. Like, when I wept, was she just thinking, oh my God, I am going to so get her? Or was she actually feeling sympathy and having to remind herself that she needed to remember to rob me? Um, I really wanted to know, and uh, I sort of briefly thought about trying to write about her in some way, but nothing ever came of it. Anyway, I think in that moment of seeing that wallet, I thought, okay, someone is definitely going to take that wallet. And then I thought, well, I'm the only person here. And it led to this leap, which is really the reason I write fiction, um, into the mind of the person on the opposite end of an equation I know all too well, 
between robber <laughs> and a crime victim. And I thought, you know, I'm going to start, instead of, I didn't take the wallet, I thought, tomorrow I'm going to write from that moment. A woman sees another woman's wallet in a restroom, boom, let's see what happens. Manhattan circa 2006, which is when this occurred. And I started writing the next day from that position. And basically what, I, and I thought I was just writing a short story, and what, I, what emerged was the, what ended up being the first chapter of this book. Then, in the course of writing that chapter, um, there's a, a very brief mention of a, of a different character. Her, this woman is on a date. Well, you'll, you'll see. I'm going to read you this. Anyway, there's a quick mention of a peripheral character that was very intriguing to me. I had intended it as kind of a laugh line, but I started thinking, huh, who is this guy? So then I thought, okay, I'm going to write one more short story about him. I'll just delay slightly longer writing this other book. And so I wrote what became the second chapter, which is about this guy. Then in the course of writing that, I got sort of intrigued by a quick mention of his ex-wife. And I thought, huh, what's her story? All right, I'm going to do one more, and that's really it about this woman. So I wrote another one, and in the course of writing that one, I realized, okay, I'm, I'm in. I don't know what I'm in, but I'm definitely going to be doing this and not that other thing. So I thought, okay, so what am I doing? <laughs> that was the question. I knew I was writing a book, and I knew it was fiction. It didn't seem like a story collection, really, but it also didn't seem like a novel because it was happening in pieces. So I thought, you know, I don't really care what it is. I'm just going to try to, to try to identify the elements that I think are fun about this, the reasons that I'm enjoying doing it, and move forward continuing to do those things. So I basically had three rules that I worked with, and that was pretty much it in terms of planning. One was that each chapter had to be about a different person, so no one could be the protagonist more than once. Rule two was that each chapter had to have a totally different mood and tone and feel than all of the others. And that was sort of the biggest, the boldest choice, I guess, or the, the most defining choice, because often in what are known as linked story collections, the stories are united by a kind of uniformity of mood and tone that signals the fact that this is all one story even though they're happening separately. But I kind of thought, if I'm writing it in pieces, why not use that to my advantage and get away with a much greater range than I could ever use in a more traditional, centrally oriented novel? So that was rule two. And rule three was that each chapter had to stand completely on its own and not require any context to be thoroughly understood and enjoyed so that it would each one would work well on its own and then ideally kind of combine into something that would be more powerful because of the individual units standing so solidly on their own and it was clear that the book was very much about the music industry everyone in it practically was connected to the music industry and at a certain point i realized it came to me that what i was really doing was writing a literary version of basically a concept album so I'm kind of dating myself here because I grew up with vinyl um, in the 1970s. But, you know, the great concept albums of that era, I think, are still pretty widely listened to, like The Who's Tommy or Quadrophenia or David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust. The idea is, and frankly, I think Recovery is a pretty good concept album. The idea is, you know, all kinds of different sounds and textures colliding and abrading, but ultimately fusing together into one story. And that's what I was trying to do in, in book form. So I'm going to read you um, just the, fir the first part of the first chapter, uh, which is you know, what I sat down and wrote that, that first day when I had no idea I was writing a book. And it's called Found Objects. It began the usual way in the bathroom of the Lassimo Hotel. Sasha was adjusting her yellow eyeshadow in the mirror when she noticed a bag on the floor beside the sink that must have belonged to the woman whose peeing she could faintly hear through the vault-like door of a toilet stall. Inside the rim of the bag, barely visible, was a wallet made of pale green leather. It was easy for Sasha to recognize, looking back, that the peeing woman's blind trust had provoked her. We live in a city where people will steal the hair off your head if you give them half a chance, but you leave your stuff lying in plain sight and expect it to be waiting for you when you come back? It made her want to teach the woman a lesson. But this wish only camouflaged the deeper feeling Sasha always had 
that fat, tender wallet offering itself to her hand. It seemed so dull, so life as usual, to just leave it there, rather than seize the moment, accept the challenge, take the leap, fly the coop, throw caution to the wind, live dangerously. I get it, cause her therapist said, and take the fucking thing. You mean steal it. He was trying to get Sasha to use that word, which was harder to avoid in the case of a wallet than with a lot of the things she lifted over the past year when her condition, as cause referred to it, had begun to accelerate. Five sets of keys, 14 pairs of sunglasses, a child's striped scarf, binoculars, a cheese grater, a pocket knife, 28 bars of soap, and 85 pens, ranging from cheap ballpoints she'd used to sign debit card slips to the aubergine Visconti that cost $260 online, which she'd lifted from her former boss's lawyer during a contracts meeting. Sasha no longer took anything from stores. Their cold, inert goods didn't tempt her, only from people. Okay, she said, steal it. Sasha and Kaz had dubbed that feeling she got the personal challenge, as in taking the wallet was a way for Sasha to assert her toughness, her individuality. What they needed to do was switch things around in her head so that the challenge became not taking the wallet, but leaving it. That would be the cure, although Kaz never used words like cure. He wore funky sweaters and let her call him Kaz, but he was old school inscrutable to the point where Sasha couldn't tell if he was gay or straight, if he'd written famous books, or if, as she sometimes suspected, he was one of those escaped cons who impersonate surgeons and wind up leaving their operating tools inside people's skulls. Of course, these questions could have been resolved on Google in less than a minute, but they were useful questions, according to Kaz, and so far, Sasha had resisted. The couch where she lay in his office was blue leather and very soft. Kaz liked the couch, he told her, because it relieved them both of the burden of eye contact. You don't like eye contact, Sasha had asked. It seemed like a weird thing for a therapist to admit. I find it tiring, he'd said. This way we can both look where we want. Where will you look? He smiled. You can see my options. Where do you usually look when people are on the couch? Around the room, Kaz said, at the ceiling, into space. Do you ever sleep? No. Sasha usually looked at the window, which faced the street, and tonight, as she continued her story, was rippled with rain. She glimpsed the wallet, tender and overripe as a peach. She'd plucked it from the woman's bag and slipped it into her own small handbag, which she'd zipped shut before the sound of peeing had stopped. She'd flicked open the bathroom door and floated back through the lobby to the bar. She and the wallet's owner had never seen each other. Pre-wallet, Sasha had been in the grip of a dire evening. Lame date, yet another, brooding behind dark bangs, sometimes glancing at the flat screen TV, where a Jets game seemed to interest him more than Sasha's admittedly overhandled tales of Benny Salazar, her old boss, who was famous for founding the Sow's Ear record label, and who also, Sasha happened to know, sprinkled gold flakes into his coffee, as an aphrodisiac she suspected, and sprayed pesticide in his armpits. Post-wallet, that was, the, that was the guy I had to pursue into another chapter. Post-wallet, however, the scene tingled with mirthful possibility. Sasha felt the waiters eyeing her as she sidled back to the table, holding her handbag with its secret weight. She sat down and took a sip of her melon madness martini and cocked her head at Alex. She smiled her yes-no smile. Hello, she said. The yes-no smile was amazingly effective. You're happy, Alex said. I'm always happy, Sasha said. Sometimes I just forget. Alex had paid the bill while she was in the bathroom, clear proof that he'd been on the verge of aborting their date. Now he studied her. Do you feel like going somewhere else? They stood. Alex wore black cords and a white button-up shirt. He was a legal secretary. On email, he'd been fanciful, almost goofy, but in person he seemed simultaneously anxious and bored. She could tell that he was in excellent shape, not from going to the gym, but from being young enough that, whatever, that his body was still imprinted with whatever sports he'd played in high school and college. Sasha, who was 35, had passed that point. Still, not even Kaz knew her real age, 
The closest anyone had come to guessing it was 31, and most put her in her 20s. She worked out daily and avoided the sun. Her online profiles all listed her as 28. As she followed Alex from the bar, she couldn't resist unzipping her purse and touching the fat green wallet just for a second for the contraction it made her feel around her heart. You're aware of how the theft makes you feel, Kaz said, to the point where you remind yourself of it to improve your mood. But do you think about how it makes the other person feel? Sasha tipped back her head to look at him. She made a point of doing this now and then, just to remind Kaz that she wasn't an idiot. She knew the question had a right answer. She and Kaz were collaborators, writing a story whose end had already been determined. She would get well. She would stop stealing from people and start caring again about the things that had once guided her. Music, the network of friends she'd made when she first came to New York, a set of goals she'd scrawled on a big sheet of newsprint and taped to the walls of her early apartments. Find a band to manage. Understand the news. Study Japanese. Practice the harp. I don't think about the people, Sasha said. But it isn't that you lack empathy, Kaz said. We know that because of the plumber. Sasha sighed. She told Kaz the plumber story about a month ago, and he'd found a way to bring it up at almost every session since. The plumber was an old man, sent by Sasha's landlord to investigate a leak in the apartment below hers. He'd appeared in Sasha's doorway, tufts of gray on his head, and within a minute, boom, he'd hit the floor and crawled under her bathtub like an animal fumbling its way into a familiar hole. The fingers he'd groped toward the bolts behind the tub were grimed to cigar stubs, and reaching made his sweatshirt hike up, exposing a soft white back. Sasha turned away, stricken by the old man's abasement, anxious to leave for her temp job, except that the plumber was talking to her, asking about the length and frequency of her showers. I never use it, she told him curtly. I shower at the gym. He nodded without acknowledging her rudeness, apparently used to it. Sasha's nose began to prickle. She shut her eyes and pushed hard on both temples. Opening her eyes, she saw the plumber's tool belt lying on the floor at her feet. It had a beautiful screwdriver in it, the orange translucent handle gleaming like a lollipop in its worn leather loop, the silvery shaft sculpted, sparkling. Sasha felt herself contract around the object in a single yawn of appetite. She needed to hold the screwdriver just for a minute. She bent her knees and plucked it noiselessly from the belt. Not a bangle jangled. Her bony hands were spastic at most things, but she was good at this, made for it, she often thought in the first drifty moments after lifting something. And once the screwdriver was in her hand, she felt instant relief from the pain of having an old, soft-backed man snuffling under her tub, and then something more than relief, a blessed indifference, as if the very idea of feeling pain over such a thing were baffling. And what about after he'd gone, Kaz had asked when Sasha told him the story, how did the screwdriver look to you then? There was a pause. Normal, she said. Really? Not special anymore? Like any screwdriver. Sasha had heard Kaz shift behind her and felt something happen in the room. The screwdriver, which she'd placed on the table, recently supplemented with the second table, where she kept the things she'd lifted and which she'd barely looked at since, seemed to hang in the air of Kaz's office. It floated between them, a symbol. And how did you feel, Kaz asked quietly, about having taken it from the plumber you pitied? How did she feel? How did she feel? There was a right answer, of course. At times, Sasha had to fight the urge to lie simply as a way of depriving Kaz of it. Bad, she said. Okay, I felt bad. Shit, I'm bankrupting myself to pay for you. Obviously, I get that this isn't a great way to live. More than once, Kaz had tried to connect the plumber to Sasha's father, who had disappeared when she was six. She was careful not to indulge this line of thinking. I don't remember him, she told Kaz. I have nothing to say. She did this for Kaz's protection and her own. They were writing a story of redemption, of fresh beginnings and second chances, but in that direction lay only sorrow. Sasha and Alex crossed the lobby of the Lassimo Hotel in the direction of the street. 
Sasha hugged her purse to her shoulder, the warm ball of wallet snuggled in her armpit. As they passed the angular budded branches by the big glass doors to the street, a woman zigzagged into their path. Wait, she said, you haven't seen, I'm desperate. Sasha felt a twang of terror. It was the woman whose wallet she'd taken. She knew this instantly, although the, the person before her had nothing in common with the blithe, raven-haired wallet owner she'd pictured. This woman had vulnerable brown eyes and flat, pointy shoes that clicked too loudly on the marble floor. There was plenty of gray in her frizzy brown hair. Sasha took Alex's arm, trying to steer him through the doors. She felt his pulse of surprise at her touch, but he stayed put. Have we seen what? He said. Someone stole my wallet. My ID is gone and I have to catch a plane tomorrow morning. I'm just desperate. She stared beseechingly at both of them. It was the sort of frank need that New Yorkers quickly learn how to hide, and Sasha recoiled. It had never occurred to her that the woman was from out of town. Have you called the police? Alex asked. The concierge said he would call, but I'm also wondering, could it have fallen out somewhere? She looked helplessly at the marble floor around their feet. Sasha relaxed slightly. This woman was the type who annoyed people without meaning to. Apology shadowed her movements even now as she followed Alex to the concierge desk. Sasha trailed behind. Is someone helping this person? She heard Alex ask. The concierge was young and spiky haired. We've called the police, he said defensively. Alex turned to the woman. Where did this happen? In the ladies room, I think. Who else was there? No one. It was empty? There might have been someone, but I didn't see her. Alex swung around to Sasha. You were just in the bathroom, he said. Did you see anyone? No, she managed to say. She had Xanax in her purse, but she couldn't open her purse. Even with it zipped, she feared that the wallet would blurt into view in some way that she couldn't control, unleashing a cascade of horrors, arrest, shame, poverty, death. Alex turned to the concierge. How come I'm asking these questions instead of you, he said. Someone just got robbed in your hotel. Don't you have, like, security? The words robbed and security managed to pierce the soothing backbeat that pumped through not just the Lassimo, but every hotel like it in New York City. There was a mild ripple of interest from the lobby. I've called security, the concierge said, adjusting his neck. I'll call them again. Sasha glanced at Alex. He was angry, and the anger made him recognizable in a way that an hour of aimless chatter, mostly hers, it was true, had not. He was new to New York. He came from someplace smaller. He had a thing or two to prove about how people should treat one another. Two security guys showed up, the same on TV and in life, beefy guys whose scrupulous politeness was somehow linked to their willingness to crack skulls. They dispersed to search the bar. Sasha wished feverishly that she'd left the wallet there as if this were an impulse she'd barely resisted. I'll check the bathroom, she told Alex, and forced herself to walk slowly around the elevator bank. The bathroom was empty. Sasha opened her purse, took out the wallet, unearthed her vial of Xanax, and popped one between her teeth. They worked faster if you chewed them. As the caustic taste flooded her mouth, she scanned the room, trying to decide where to ditch the wallet. In the stall, under the sink? The decision paralyzed her. She had to do this right, to emerge unscathed, and if she could, if she did, she had a frenzied sense of making a promise to cause. The bathroom door opened and the woman walked in. Her frantic eyes met Sasha's in the bathroom mirror, narrow, green, equally frantic. There was a pause during which Sasha felt that she was being confronted. The woman knew, had known all along. Sasha handed her the wallet. She saw from the woman's stunned expression that she was wrong. I'm sorry, Sasha said quickly, it's a problem I have. The woman opened the wallet her physical relief at having it back coursed through Sasha in a warm rush as if their bodies had fused. Everything's there, I swear, she said. I didn't even open it. I, it's this problem I have, but I'm getting help. I just, please don't tell. I'm hanging on by a thread. The woman glanced up, her soft brown eyes moving over Sasha's face. What did she see? Sasha wished that she could turn and peer in the mirror again as if something about herself might at last be revealed, some lost thing. 
But she didn't turn. She held still and let the woman look. It struck her that the woman was close to her own age, her real age. She probably had children at home. Okay, the woman said, looking down, it's between us. Thank you, Sasha said, thank you, thank you. Relief and the first gentle waves of Xanax made her feel faint and she leaned against the wall. She sensed the woman's eagerness to get away. She longed to slide to the floor. There was a rap on the door, a man's voice. Any luck? All right, I'll stop there. <laughs> And now I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Yes. I'm just amazed at how much tension you can create in these stories. And just in that last moment, then I'm thinking of when the band member in, in one of the early stories goes out and takes pictures of the lions. Oh. Um, and then almost gets killed. How do you do it? What do you? How do you know that you're you're going in a direction of of such great interest? That's a great question. I mean, of course, I don't always. I mean, there was plenty of clunkers that didn't end up in here. Um, so, you know, I, I often don't know. I mean, my writing method is a little bit odd in that I write, I write fiction only by hand. I write journalism on a computer, but I, I really can only write fiction by hand. And the reason is that I'm trying to, I don't want to be reading what I write as I write it. And I don't want to be thinking very much. I, I'm trying to get into a state where it's almost as if I'm reading it myself, because that's when I seem to get to the best material. Now, everyone has their own method, and one of the big challenges for any writer is just figuring out what method works for you. So it's not that I'm recommending this necessarily, but for me, the, the only way I can tell if, I'm, if a situation is converging in a way that feels tense and exciting is that I actually feel it as I'm writing. That's kind of the only gauge I have. So I, that's one of, I mean, it really speaks to the question of why I write the way I do, because I want to experience the action unfolding as if I were kind of discovering it as I write it, rather than plan ahead what will happen in a kind of top-down way and then, you know, sort of execute that planning. That doesn't seem to work for me so much. Now, of course, it's not like I just, you know, spew out a first draft and get it published. I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. I actually said the first part of my writing method to one audience and never told them the rest. So I sounded like this amazing genius who just sort of spews and, and it's all perfect. It, it, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's a disaster. The first drafts are always really clunkily written and totally chaotic. But the big moves, the, the kind of elements of the scenes that make them fun are usually there if, if the chapter is going to work or the story is going to work. And as I said, some didn't. I also I have a writing group that I am very reliant on, which is kind of another part of my method that's important, which is, you know, I, I, I often I can be totally wrong. Like sometimes I'll think something's very tense and exciting. We, we don't look at anything on a page. We only read aloud. And there is nothing more unpleasant than reading aloud something you thought was great and just feeling the leaden weight of it settling over the room and, you know, watching people kind of going like that. So it's, you know, but better to find out there. <laughs> You're going to find out of it in the end anyway, is what I always think. So, you know, I go through the stages of grieving and, and plotting the fact that I'll never talk to any of them again. And once I'm through with that, I think about their critiques and I try to fix what I've got. So, but I would say the real, the, the big impulses and, and the real sense of what to do and how to do it is pretty instinctive. Yes. Um, I was interested to hear about the rules that you set for yourself. Um, I've often heard visual artists in particular really talk about, you know, talk about setting the rules. And oh, that's interesting. Them. Yeah. But I haven't heard a writer talk about it. I was curious, was it just for this book that you decided to set the rules to create the inspiration or is it a common use? I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call, I, I think that the, the rarity here was that there were so few rules. I mean, normally what the, what happens is I, well, in this, this book I wrote in pieces, but it, it's sort of the same whether I'm writing something short or something long. I write a first draft, then I type it into the computer, which in the case of a, a novel that I wrote that do, isn't in pieces can take months, literally. I'm typing, you know, hundreds of pages. Brutal. Then I read it, which is the really difficult part. And then I sit down and I make a very clear, systematic outline of what, what I need to do and how to fix it. 
So I become somewhat rule bound at that point, although once I go back into the writing state, which I do by hand on hard copies, again, I'm sort of, I'm back in that kind of unconscious mode. And that's why I need all those rules, because I'm not going to remember any of it once I'm sort of back into the impulsive phase. Um, with this one, the rules were more an attempt to guide me as I created that first draft because I just felt like I needed to, since I wasn't sure what it was and it could potentially be anything and go in any direction, I felt like I just wanted to try to isolate what seemed interesting and fun about what I had. The first three chapters that I wrote are actually, they're not in the order that they are in the book. They all went backwards. So I actually thought for a long time that the whole book would go backwards and it turned out it didn't work well in that order. But, you know, but what they all had in common was they were each about a different person. I love the kind of different textures of them. And then the, the fact that they each stood on their own just seemed like a really strong, a, a sound structural principle. You know, if all the elements are strong and they fit together, wouldn't the whole be stronger for it? So that was really it. Um, I do often have a kind of visual graphic in my mind of how books look, which is interesting. Like my novel, Look at Me, I imagined as a figure eight. Um, my novel, The Keep, was two concentric circles. Um, this one I saw as a kind of a tangle. I imagined sort of a, a tangle of yarn or string, something like that. So there's, I, I, and I, you know, I, I derive a lot of inspiration and sometimes like direct ideas from the visual arts. So it may be that that's another reason that there's kind of an overlap there. Yes. I think like most jobs, it, it feels different ways at different times. I mean, if, if I'm really enjoying it and I feel I, I have that sense of it building tension that I talked about earlier, then I'm excited. Like there were scenes in here that I, I stopped before I got to them and I didn't really know what the scene would consist of, but I felt a kind of energy about approaching it that made me excited and even a little scared to do it because always there's the feeling of like, well, what if nothing happens? Um, so sometimes it can be, ex and, and the feeling of writing and having that sense that the tension is building is, is really exciting. It's, you know, it's exciting to read and have that feeling. And it, I would say it's even more exciting to be writing and have that feeling. So that, those are the good days, but there are some really bad days. I mean, every feeling you could have about any job happens here. Like there are times when it just, it feels like it's going nowhere and that is a, a kind of misery that's really like no other that I know. I mean, it just feels like anything good that happens isn't really good because it's all on this foundation that's not, you know, that's not solid. So it can be really depressing. And, and there are also phases that are just quite boring. You know, it, it, it can be real, real drudgery li like anything. But I mean, all of that being said, I, I really do. For me, it's, it's almost to say that I love it isn't quite enough. It, it's just some, it's basic to my this, my relationship with the world. So for me, it's it's just essential. Yes. I'm surprised I haven't gotten more of that, actually. Um, I don't know what they're, I can't imagine they were thrilled about it. Um, I don't have, I'm, you know, not here as a champion of PowerPoint by any means. I had never used PowerPoint before I wrote this chapter. Um, I wasn't even totally sure what it was, honestly. Once I got in there, I had to, there were some hurdles. I didn't have it on my computer, it turned out. I didn't have enough memory to hold it. And it was not cheap, you know? So it, actually, when I first thought I wanted to work in PowerPoint, I thought, I, you know, I write by hand, so I don't really need the actual program. So I drew some rectangles on my yellow legal pads, and I sort of sat down and waited for some PowerPoint to happen. But you know, it, not surprisingly, not very much happened. Um, so uh, you know, for me, PowerPoint was it worked, and not everyone agrees on this. Some people really don't like that chapter and think it shouldn't be there. I feel like it's the heart of the book and that the book would be much weaker without it. But it's a very, it's not like I'm burning to do it again. There was a particular reason that PowerPoint worked for me. And that reason was 
that it's a very disc, it's a very um, segmented form. There's no continuity to it. It's moments and pauses. That's a little bit the way the whole book is structured. So for me, it was a chance to make manifest the uh, structural underpinnings of the whole book and to get into some material that I was extremely interested in exploring, which were pauses in rock and roll songs. And that's one of those topics that's hard to work into a book. <laughs> I was I had tried various ways and was finding it difficult. PowerPoint, which is made of pauses, was kind of the perfect place to do that. And because it's so cold and corporate, it allowed me to tell a very sweet, sentimental story that I think would have been quite cloying if I had done it in a more conventional way. So PowerPoint served me well. As far as how its effect on people who use it all the time, I, I truly have no idea because I'm not in the corporate world. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't even comment on it. But I will say this. I mean, I have had people say to me, aren't you worried that you've opened a Pandora's box and now kids are only going to want to write fiction in PowerPoint? I don't see that happening. It's actually very, very hard to do because of the discontinuity. You know, creating a narrative it, in a way is all about continuity. It's the flow of one thing to the next. PowerPoint can't render up that flow for all of Microsoft's efforts to let slides dissolve and one to the next and fade one to the next. They're trying to they're trying to hide really the fact that there is no dissolving or fading. There's just boom, boom, boom. I, I will be amazed if this takes off as a form to write fiction in. So we'll see. Uh, well, you know, if you do it well, they'll say, well, she gave it a try, but look at this. So that's what you got to go for. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Your book has received a, a ton of critical attention. Does that kind of and level of appreciation um, validate what you've done or make you more self-conscious? I feel that, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to have it, you know. I mean, my other books have all had pretty mixed reviews, and so I'm, I never expected to get this kind of love, honestly, especially for a book that is kind of weird. You know, I was just hoping to hold my own and, you know, really let it rip with this one that I never actually write, but just think about and talk about. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I have to say I don't, I mean, maybe... Maybe when I actually get into a new book, I'll start to be really frightened about being exposed as a fraud or I guess all the things that you might think. But I feel like my, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that will happen or not. I mean, I, I basically just have really tried to enjoy it. I feel like it's, it's not often that you get this kind of luck and it would be just crazy to, to find reasons to be unhappy about it. I just feel like, you know, have fun. My God, if you can't have fun when your book is getting prizes and selling, you know, it's time to think about what, you know, it's time to go see cause and, and discuss the, the problem, you know? So I really, I have basically just felt great about it, honestly. I really have. And I, when I find myself, you know, slipping into, a, you know, a sort of, woe is me, I have to talk so much, I think, you know, you don't have to do anything. Do it because you want to. And if you're not into it, stop. And, um, and I keep doing it. So I think it's, I think it's still what I feel like doing. <laughs> yeah. Do you write about only those things that you know, or do you start out with your writing in, in, re uh, in research? Or like the PowerPoint, you obviously uh, had to uh, be looked into that a little bit. So is there some combination of what you know? And you know, I tend to, um, I don't write <laughs> about myself or anyone I know. So the feeling I have is that I'm always writing about what I don't know. So when I was a kid in school, a writer came to visit, and I didn't—I actually wanted to be a doctor, so I didn't have any personal, you know, feel. I mean, I was incredulous that she, this lady, could have actually written a book. That seemed amazing, but I was maybe seven or eight, and I remember she said she had one piece of advice for all of us as we sat in the auditorium: write what you know. For me, the single least useful piece of advice I've ever received, because I'm actually terrible at writing about what I what I know. I, I freeze up. I, I'm not. I think because my process is so much 
um, one of at least feeling like I'm discovering and, and having an exciting ex you know, adventure as it unfolds. If I feel like I already know the world I'm writing about, my fun is not really happening there for me. I sort of feel quite bored. So that being said, that doesn't mean that I always need to do research. Because sometimes, for example, there's a chapter in here that takes place in the punk rock scene in San Francisco in 1979. Um, I did very little research for that. I was in San Francisco at that time in high school. I went to the club that these kids go to. I was, you know, a total wallflower and, you know, not daring or anything, just, just an observer, which I felt terribly about at the time. But... Um, but I did see it, and I have a good memory for certain things, very bad for some things. But I'm pretty good at remembering just textures and little details, uh, even things that happened a really long time ago. So for that chapter, but, but the people in the chapter are totally made up. The situations are totally made up. There's no one I really recognize there. So it's a combination in that case of what I know and what I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly prepared to do research. I had to do a fair amount of research on the technology of music recording. That was probably the area that I really most needed because Benny Salazar, who's the other main character in the book, the guy who sprays pesticide in his armpits and puts gold flakes in his coffee, is a working producer. And there's one chapter where I'm basically following him through his work day and that I needed to spend many hours on the phone with a mixer just to really understand the difference between analog and digital recording, for example. But I would say overall this was a pretty lightly researched book. The, the one that I keep avoiding um, takes place in the 40s, so that is a very heavily researched book. Maybe that's for some, maybe that's why I'm having so much trouble starting it, even though I've done a lot of the research. Um, so it, it depends. There's a different, a different quantity in each book. Usually I, I do know if something is a book or not. I think the only reason I didn't know with this was that it was, since it is actually freestanding stories and it's something bigger, I think I, I didn't know with this one only because at first I just thought I was writing a few stories and then it started to become clear to me that they, that they were part of something bigger. But usually I know the scale of, of an idea pretty much from the start, even though I don't have much of an idea. I just have a sense of time and place. But... With a book, it feels sort of like a big shape whose presence is detectable and, and whose size is sort of perceptible to me. So, I don't know, it would be sort of like sensing a huge cloud moving in my direction or something like that. Whereas with a story, I, I have a sense that it will be something smaller. I usually do know at the beginning. I don't know, quite know why. Jennifer, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for coming. Happy to, happy to sign books.